Yeah. Woo. <laughs> I just want to thank and praise Yahweh Almighty, the one who sits high and looks low on me because he's mindful of me. That's just awesome to me. And as always, I count it a privilege to stand before the saints and bring forth his word. And may it go forth as he would have it to for his glory. I was thinking about my journey, this spiritual journey that I embarked on many, many years ago. And where I used to be and where I'm at now. And not that I've arrived or anything, because i got a whole lot more to do to get to where I need to be. But just in hindsight, looking at where I was, where I'm at now, I'm just fascinated. I kind of just stand in awe. And, like, really, the only person in here who can really attest to what I used to be is Inez, because she knew me as a youth when I was in the, the height of my wickedness. She knew me then, you know. And I was thinking about how when I first got saved, and I was coming to church, and I had this hunger for the word. You know, I was just anxious to learn more and more about him. It was like I was on fire. You know, that happens when you first make that commitment to give your life to, to Yeshua. But I remember one of my strongholds was prayer. See, I was the one who wouldn't pray out loud. I prayed in my mind. Like, I didn't even move my lips. I just bowed my head, closed my eyes, and thought in my mind what I wanted to pray. And that's how I prayed. And Micah used to always say, come on, Denise, let's pray together. You know, and I would be doing my thing, and Micah would be praying. He would be like, well, you lead out. And I'd be like, I am. <laughs> I'm praying hard. <laughs> and he'd be like, Denise, you got to open your mouth and speak. I'm like, I'm praying. I'm praying, you know. And so for the most part, Micah led out most of our prayer sessions, you know. And then my, my father-in-law, Sylvester, used to put me on the spot all the time at church. Sister Denise, you say the prayer. I'd be like, oh, my gosh. I used to hate him for that. I did. I used to just cringe. I used to be like, you know what? I'm not coming to church. If he's going to be making me pray, I'm not coming to church. But I thank him now because he pushed me out of my comfort zone. I think that had he not done that, I don't think I ever would have grew from that place of just praying in my head what I wanted to pray. But I still hadn't arrived because when me and Micah would have our prayer time together, Micah would lay prostrate on the floor and pour himself out before the Father. It was like it was just him and Yahweh, like I wasn't even there. And I was to the point of verbally speaking my prayer, but I still wasn't like ready to surrender everything like Micah was. And Micah used to always tell me, Denise, you know, you got to humble yourself. You got to come before the Father and pour yourself out a drink offering before the Father. you got to empty yourself of you so that he can deposit in you the things that you need to overcome in this realm. And I used to listen to all that, but I just really wasn't there. And in hindsight, now I can look back and say it was pride. At the time, I really wasn't trying to be prideful. I just didn't know how to humble myself. But now I know it was pride. I just didn't want to look bad. I didn't want to, you know what I mean? But one day I was home alone. Micah was gone. The kids were gone. I had my, my gospel music on. I'm praising Yahweh, you know. And I thought, uh, this would be a good time to try this pour yourself out thing. This would be a good time. You know, nobody's here. It's just me and Yahweh. I'm, I'm feeling the presence because I'm jamming to my music, you know. So I said, all right, I'm going to do this thing, right? So I get down on my knees and I lay out on the floor and I begin to pray. And I begin to empty myself of me. I pray about everything that I'm holding back, all these things in my life that I suppress, you know, all these things that Yahweh already knows, but he's just waiting for me to speak it out of my mouth. I'm just praying it all. I'm, put, I'm confessing all kinds of stuff. I'm putting everything out on the table. I'm just, I'm, I'm telling him my desires and what I want and, and help I need and strength and just everything, you know, and it was so liberating to just be able to do that. And just pour myself out before the Father. But then I got a little happy with it. I got bold and I said, Yahweh, I want you to show me me. See, I don't know if you realize it or not, but there's three different ways that you're viewed. There's the way that you see yourself, the way other people see you, and then there's how you really are. See, most of the time we can't see ourselves. We only see what we want to see in ourselves. Other people can see things in us that we're not so quick to receive, but even they don't see the whole of the matter. But Yahweh does. He sees all of you. 
And me, with my little bold self, I decided that I wanted to see how Yahweh sees me. So that's what I prayed. Yahweh, just show me me. Like, I want to see how you see me. See, at this point, I'm thinking I've, I've arrived. You know, I'm, I'm able to pour myself out now. I, I've come a long way. So I'm laying there, and I got my eyes closed, and I'm just thinking about that. And I start to get uh, memories of things I've done in my life. You know, I was thinking about all the wicked and perverse and evil things that I had done in my youth, all the people I heard along the way, things that I've said, stuff I got away with or seemingly got away with. I, you know, I started revisiting all these different things. And then I began to weep. But it was a joyful weep because it's like in all of that, Yahweh reached out for me. In spite of me, Yahweh sought me out. It says he came to seek and save the lost. He sought me out. I began to cry, but it was a joyful kind of weep. Like, man, I was really out there. But still, he looked on me, you know. And then I started seeing, you know, when I got baptized, we went up to Moraine State Park, me, Sylvester, Norma, and Micah, and I got baptized in the lake, and how I seen myself in church and growing in the Word, and I was, I was happy at this point. I'm, I'm seeing me. This is, yeah, you know. But then I started to see all these things that I've done since I got saved. All these wicked things, these thoughts, people I've heard, stuff I've said, things I seemingly got away with. I started seeing all these things. Then I really began to weep. Because, see, this is after the born-again experience. You know, when you go down in that watery grave, you're supposed to die there. Come up a new creation, born again. All of that that I was is forgiven under the blood of Yeshua. And here I am, saved, sanctified, Holy Spirit filled, but I still have all of these things in my life that shouldn't be there. All of these sins, all of these bad attitudes and thoughts, perverse, wicked things that I'm struggling with. And I'm just weeping at this point. And I tell you, ever since that day, I still pray for Yahweh to show me me because it's my desire to grow in him and come up higher in him. I want to know where I fall short. I want to know what strongholds are in my life. I want to see these things so that I can address them and with his strength overcome in these areas. You know, I don't want to be in ignorance anymore, but I'm not going to lie to you. I don't do that often because it, it's, it's a hard thing to see you. It's a hard thing to see you. But I thank Yahweh for that. And so most recently, I was praying that. I was like, okay, y'all, <laughs> show me me. You know what I mean? <laughs> not so bold this time, but still desiring to see the things in me that are not pleasing in his sight. And what he was showing me is, I have a whole lot of world still in me. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about worldliness and what it really is. Turn with me to 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. Now, throughout this whole book of 1 John, he's talking about the things in the world, love of the world, you know, the Antichrist, all these different things. This is actually one of my favorite books is all three of the 1 Johns, 1, 2, and 3, you know, 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> so 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, these do not come from the Father but are from the world. And the world passes away and disappears, and with it the forbidden cravings of it. But he who does the will of Yahweh and carries out his purposes in his life abides forever. John starts out by giving us this exhortation, admonishment, a strong warning. Do not love the world. Do not love the world. Now, we're all familiar with John 3.16, right? For Yah so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So if Yahweh could love the world, what is the problem with us loving the world? That's the question. 
But in order to answer the question, you have to understand that that word world has several different meanings in scripture. The word world is used to refer to this created world, like all these things that we can see down here, this round. But it's also used to speak about people who are lost. Lost people are the world, people who are not a part of the body of Messiah. They are lost. They are the world. But also, it's speaking about this world system, which is under the influence of Satan. Now, obviously, in John 3, 16, that world, for y'all so love the world, he's speaking about lost people. That's the world he's talking about. But in these verses right here, do not love the world, he's talking about the world system, which is under the control of Satan. So this doesn't give you guys an out for those people that you don't want to love them. This is not those people. This is the world system which is under Satan. And we know this because later in 1 John chapter 5, he says, We know that we are children of Yahweh and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So that is the world that he's speaking about. Do not love the world system, basically. And he's letting us know that there's no middle ground here. You either love Yahweh or you love the world. You can't love them both at the same time. The scripture is very plain. He says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So it's not possible to love both. In James chapter 4, he calls it adultery, spiritual adultery. He says that in order for me as a married woman to have another lover besides my husband, I have to take love away from my husband to give it to another. So love that belongs to my husband is going to someone else. It's the same thing with Father Yahweh. We're in a marital relationship with Yeshua. We're the bride. He's the groom. We are one. My love is supposed to be for Yahweh and him alone. I can't divide my love between him and the world. I have to take what belongs to Yahweh away from him to give it to something in this world. So I'm not doing what I need to be doing. That is adultery, spiritual adultery. But more than adultery, it's also idolatry. Idolatry. Now, in the Old Testament, we see so many scriptures that talk about adultery. There's one that says, Hear, O Israel, I am Yahweh, your El. Love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. See, he wasn't accepting. They couldn't just love the God of Abraham and give some of their love to Kamosh, some to Baal, some to Ashtoreth. He wasn't having it. Well, it's no different for us today. Love Yahweh with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, all. You can't divide your love for him with the love for the world. It doesn't work that way. So we have to be careful, saints, that we're not loving on the world. See, I was thinking about, you know, my kids are young now, and they're starting to get into the boys and the girls, you know, this, this little elementary kind of puppy love thing, you know. And I, it takes me back to when I was young, and I was thinking about how boys that liked you, they used to pick on you, you know what I mean? Just beat up on you and talk about you, rip on you, pick on you. And really, deep down, they liked you, but they didn't want anybody to know they liked you. So they would treat you like that, but secretly they liked you. Me and Micah were talking about the Hey Arnold cartoon. How many people watch Hey Arnold? <laughs> now on Arnold, the girl likes Arnold, but in his presence she's like, you football head, and you, you know, she's dogging him out, but behind the scenes she's like, oh, Arnold, I just love you so much. And, you know, but she has this love for him, but it's a secret kind of thing. So I was thinking, you know, as believers, how many of us have that for the world? You know, we talk about the world, we dog them out, talk about what they ain't doing, but secretly we just love it. We love it. We're caught up in it. And I was thinking about how we got to be careful so we don't get sucked into this world system. <coughs> so in this message, you basically have to be honest with yourself because only you know where you're at. We don't know. <coughs> I need some water. <coughs> so I was thinking, how many of us have that 
love-hate kind of relationship with the world. Secretly, we do love the world, but we don't want each other to know about it. So we keep that stuff from each other. But Yahweh knows. So today, my goal is to just enlighten you to some of the things that could get in and pollute and distort the worldview that you should have, which is a biblical worldview. So that if you have these things in your life, if this is your attitude or your thought process, that you would recognize it as a tool of the enemy and seek to have that thing removed from your walk. Now, worldliness is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. The lust of the fresh flesh is crave, craving gratification. In other words, it's a sinful desire or passion which appeals to your fallen nature. Now, there's certain physical desires that you have that are normal. They're God-given desires. But when you use them in an abnormal or forbidden way, they become lust of the flesh. Take, for example, sexual desire. Yahweh says that sex is a gift. It's a gift that he's given us. So this desire that we have is natural. It's normal. And in and of itself, it's not a sin, not a sinful desire. However, if you try to fulfill that desire in, a, in an abnormal way or a forbidden way, now it is lust of the flesh. So any sex outside of marriage is lust of the flesh. Now, the reason I bring this up specifically is because this is one of the biggest lies the world has right now. They say it is okay for people to live together and not be married and indulge in sexual relations and behave like a married couple without actually being married. And this is what the world is selling to our kids. This is what they're teaching. This is their view. And a lot of people have bought into this view. But the thing about it is, Yahweh is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his rules didn't change. Sex is for in the confines of marriage only. Only, and just because the majority of people think it's acceptable and okay, one day you got to stand before a holy God and give an account for the choices that you made. And guess what? If you bought into the world system, you will be doomed to suffer the world's fate. If you are part of the world, you will go down with the world. I want the young people to hear this. It's not okay because Yahweh didn't change. And I want you to think about this the next time you think about what everybody else is doing. The scripture says the majority of people will take the broad way, which leads to destruction. Do you know what that means? And the narrow way, which leads to the kingdom. Do you know what that means? That means the majority of people are going to hell. Who wants to be in that majority? Who wants to say everybody else is going there? I want to go there too. You think about that. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. It doesn't matter if all of society condones this. Yahweh does not. As far as this example as an abnormal use, homosexuality. The world says it's okay. It's acceptable. They've invited them to come out of the closet. They've embraced them. They're taking the pulpit in churches. They're teaching our kids that this is an acceptable, alternative lifestyle. If you buy into this lie, you are worldly. That is not what Yahweh says. Yahweh says homosexuality is an abomination before him. An abomination. And when you stand before this holy God in judgment, he will send you to hell with the rest of the world because you bought into the world system. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind. That's what the Amplified says, greedy longings of the mind. An inordinate desire for the finer things in life. We've all heard the expression, feast your eyes on this. You know, eyes, be, that's where your desires begin. Lust of the eyes. How about the pride of life? Uh-oh. Assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things. 
Pride is boasting on one's importance to the point of it becoming vain glory. Pride. Seeking glory that belongs to who? Yahweh. The scripture says all glory, all honor, all praise belongs to who? Yahweh. So when we begin to seek glory for ourselves, that's that tooting your own horn. Toot, toot. Look what I did. Look what I've done. You know, when we get to that point, we need to recognize that that's pride. That is pride of life. Pride comes before the fall. If you have a prideful spirit, remember that Yahweh humbles the proud and exalts the humble. It's always better to let other people toot your horn. Always better to let other people lift you up, exalt you, magnify you for something you've done or are doing. But we have to be careful here because when we engage in this type of behavior, we have a worldly mindset. Worldliness is rooted in pride and selfishness, and it is in direct contrast to holiness and righteousness because the root of worldliness is sin. Now, we can all agree with that, right? And we all have our labels for what's worldly. We talk about people's worldly music or how they dress or how they conversate, cursing and whatnot, you know, doing all kinds of wickedness. That's worldly. But what I want to bring to your attention today is that worldliness is not something that's just limited to people outside the church. See, that's where most of our labels fall. When we say worldly, we're not talking about each other, and we're not talking about people in the body. We're talking about them people out there who ain't living for Yahweh, who ain't loving on Yahweh, and who ain't serving them. But worldliness has invaded our churches all across the nation. And it's because we feed into these worldviews that they have out here. All of these things that the world teaches are acceptable and okay are in direct opposition to what Yahweh says is okay and acceptable. And we buy into it. But you don't want to be part of the world because the world's already condemned. And if you're part of it, you go down with the ship. When they go down, you go down. Just because you profess Christianity does not necessarily make you not of this world. Be you doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Are you deceiving yourself? This is where you got to be honest. I mean, think about it. How devoted are you to entertainment or sports or possessions, getting stuff, more stuff, better stuff, bigger stuff, pleasures? How about money? How much does money pull at you, your desire for more money? Do you sometimes miss church or prayer meeting or Bible study because you got something you'd rather be doing? Well, I got things to do. I worked all day. I'm tired. (laughs) I I ain't got that to do today. (laughs) They be all right. I could pray right here. You know what I mean? All that. I'm sure glad that when they crucified Yeshua, he didn't say, hey, I got something else to do right now. (laughs) What you love is demonstrated by the things that you make priorities in your life every day. You prove to yourself to everybody that knows you, and to Yahweh what you really love by the things that you do every day, the choices that you make. What's priority in your life? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We don't want to conform to this world. Turn with me to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Elohim, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto El, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of Yahweh. Verse 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. Conform means to shape one's behavior or to be conformed to a pattern or mold. And world is speaking about this present age, 
this time. So together, do not shape your behavior to this present age. In other words, do not let the times we live in force you into its way of thinking or behaving. Paul is saying that the world has its own way of thinking and doing things and that believers are not to think and act like the world. Instead, he says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. What Paul is presenting here is the clash of worldviews. He's saying, don't think like them. Don't act like them. Hold Yahweh up as your standard. Act like him. You know, behavior is directly related to how we think. It stems from what we think, our attitudes, our beliefs, our values, our opinions. And the main reason people don't act like Yeshua is because they don't think like Yeshua. That's the problem. So we got to be mindful, saints, that we don't get sucked into some of these worldviews that the world is trying to sell us. Worldview is simply the way a person looks at the world. The dictionary definition is the overall perspective from which one sees and interprets the world. Now, every single one of us in here has a worldview. Whether you realize it or not, it's a key part in your life. Worldview matters. It's at the root of how you think and how you react to certain things. Now, there's several worldviews out here that go directly opposite of what Yahweh says. For instance, the world says tit for tat. Somebody does you wrong, paybacks. You do them wrong. Vengeance is yours. You go out there and make them pay. But the Bible don't say that. The scripture says love your enemy. Pray for those that despitefully use you. How many of us have bought into this lie from the world? If you have, you're worldly. How about forgiveness? Scripture says, forgive your brother as I have forgiven you. How many of us harbor bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness towards people? Because that's the world's way. The world says, don't forgive them. They deserve for you to punish them and be mad. Separate from you. You ain't got to deal with that. They did you wrong. You'd be like, yeah, they did me wrong. And then you feel justified in your sin. All sin separates from the love of Yahweh. If you bought into this lie from the world, you're worldly. How about materialism? Materialism says success is measured by what you have. Oh, how many saints have fallen prey to this? How many? The one who has the most toys wins. Materialism can be summed up in one word, more. See, a materialistic person is never satisfied or content with what they have. They're always seeking more, 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 more. Never happy with what they have. Yahweh blesses them, and they receive the blessing, and they're happy for a moment, but then they immediately have their eyes on the next blessing. I want more. I want a house. Oh, Yahweh gave me a house. Yes. I want a bigger house. I want a car. No, I want a bigger car. Oh, I want a new car. I, you know, we're never satisfied. Materialism. Materialism would have you to believe that life is about acquiring things. That's the world's view. This is where the prosperity message comes from. Feeding into people's desire for more stuff. Prosperity, name it, claim it. All these things that promote coveting. This is the world's view. How many of us have adopted this worldview? You got to be honest with yourself. How many of out here are seeking more, more, more stuff? Trying to have an abundance of possessions, bigger car, bigger house, grander vacations. How many of us? Yeshua's response to materialism is in Luke 12. He says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Yeshua said that. We can't be conformed to this world of materialism. Life is not about acquiring possessions in this realm, but rather building up treasure in the kingdom. You think about Yeshua. What did he have? He didn't have a place to lay his head. He didn't have his own cult or donkey to ride on. He didn't have his own tomb. He didn't have none of that. But he had everything that he needed. 
Aren't we the same way, saints? Hasn't Yahweh blessed us? Don't we have everything we need right now today? Yahweh has blessed us. We can't be conformed to this worldview. Another one that's infiltrated the church is the mighty me. The mighty me. It's all about me. Selfism. It's just about me. I got to look out for number one. I got to get mine. Selfism comes in. That mighty me and destroys relationships. Many a marriage has been broken up because of the mighty me. That's the person who says, you know what? I'm getting a divorce, and I don't really care how it affects my children or my spouse or my witness. I don't care. I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled, and I'm out. That's the mighty me. Now, they don't say it like that, but the person who does not honor their vow to stay together through better or worse, sickness, health, all those things, that's exactly what they're saying in their actions. That is exactly what they're saying. Selfishness, self-centeredness, an individualistic way of life. The person who says that my needs or my desires should be served at the expense of others. Yahweh's two greatest commandments. Love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Where in the world did he tell us to love ourselves? Where? It's not about you. It's about other people. How many of us have bought into this lie, into this worldview? Because if you have, then you're worldly. Yeshua's response to this is, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Don't be conformed to this worldview, this mighty me, because Yeshua says you only begin to live when you give your life away. You have to die daily so that Yeshua can live and reign in your body. You must decrease so he can increase. We all know this, right? right? Another worldview that's crept into the church is this emotion thing. Do whatever feels good. If it feels good to me, it's okay. I don't really care what you think because it feels good to me. But we can't be ruled by our emotions because emotions will deceive you. I'll give you a classic example of when your emotions aren't really reality. If I get on one of my kids' case, they get punished for something. They may think to themselves, I hate her. They may feel that in that moment. But deep down at the core of who they are, they don't hate their parents. They dislike the situation. They dislike the punishment. They dislike, but they don't hate. But your emotion would have you to believe that that's the case. Emotions are misleading. You can't be led by your emotion. It's not about how you feel. How about this one? I don't feel like going to church today. I don't feel like it, so I'm not going to go. I don't feel like reading my Bible. I don't feel like praying to Yahweh. I don't feel like it. Well, I got an answer for you when you don't feel like it. I was thinking about, I work now so I can speak on this matter. I never feel like going to work, ever. Every single day when I get up, I have a battle with myself. Do I really want to work? No, I don't really want to work. Micah can make this money. I ain't got to go to work. Micah can take care of me. I have this battle every single day because I don't want to go to work. I don't feel like going to work. But what motivates me to get up off that bed and go to work is that paycheck because I want my paycheck to be right. I don't want it to be short. I want my money. I'm going to get up off this bed. I'm going to go to work because I want my money. Well, I want you to think about the reward that awaits you for living a spiritual life, for walking after the ways of Yahweh. So the next time you're sitting at home and you say, I don't feel like going to church, you think about what you're giving up. See, that's what I do about work. At work, I say, I don't feel like going to work. And I start thinking about my money. Oh, I'm giving up money. I got to go. Got to go to work. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's no different with Yahweh. Your reward is so much greater. How do we just say, I don't feel like going to church and don't go? Your reward is so much greater. Coming to church, he's going to encourage you and strengthen you and deposit seed in you that's going to take hold in your life and help you to overcome the strongholds of the enemy. See, the enemy would have you to believe the church does nothing for you. That is another lie from the world. Every time you come through them doors, 
seeds are being planted. Strongholds are being broken. You are being awakened to things in your life that you need to purge out of your system. You don't stay away from church because you don't feel like it. Whenever you don't feel like it, it is your flesh. And the scripture says the people who sow after the flesh reap the reward of the flesh, which is condemnation. So when you feel that, the spiritual man in you ain't never going to say, I don't feel like going to church. The spiritual man in you ain't never going to say, I don't feel like going to prayer meeting. I don't feel like going to Friday night Bible study. That's your flesh. And when your flesh rises up, what you supposed to do? Beat that thing down. And I'm not judging because every week I got to have that battle too. I mean, I don't feel like going to prayer meeting. And then I write, oh, the flesh is trying to rule. I'm, I'm here. That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. That's called pressing on to the high calling. That's what that is, overcoming the flesh. Don't let the flesh get any stronghold in your life. None. But we do. We do. <coughs> Another one is relativism. What's true for you may not be true for me. Now, we just covered this in Friday night Bible study. And it was a good study because this is a popular one. And most of the world falls into this now. Nobody wants to tell somebody else that what they're doing is wrong. As a matter of fact, the only way you can be wrong in this society is if you try to tell somebody else that they're wrong. That's the only way to be wrong. But as children of the Most High God, we have to believe in the infallible word of Yahweh, that his word alone is absolute truth, that apart from that, there is no other truth. The only truth that matters in the end is Yahweh's truth, not what the world sells us. Proverbs says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. If we don't cling to the truth of Yahweh, we're going to get swallowed up by these worldviews. And anyone who opposes Yahweh and his word will discover the way to death. We can't be conformed to relativism. Yeshua says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. Truth is not relative. How many of us have adopted this worldview? Well, it might be true for you, but it's not true for me. Is it true in this word? then it's not truth. We got to be careful because if we fall into this, we are worldly. Another popular worldview that's gaining power is this new age movement, humanism. You are your own God. Everything you need is already in you. It's all there. You are the master of your own fate. You determine your destiny. You are in control. All contrary to the word of Yahweh. Only Yahweh is in control. He's sovereign. You didn't control this day. Like somebody's testimony, this day was a gift to you. It did not have to be. This day, your breath, your health, all that you have is because of Yahweh's blessing over you. Not because you did anything to make it happen, but that's what they teach, that everything you do and need is in you. They worship themselves, and which is ironic because Yahweh created us to worship, right? We're going to worship something. We're going to attach ourselves to something outside of us, and we're going to worship it. So if you're not worshiping Yahweh, you may be out here worshiping trees or deers or the sky or a man or a woman or food or any countless number of things, but you're worshiping something. That's that new age stuff. We got to stay clear of that. We can't be conformed to it. We have to submit ourselves to Yahweh's word and learn who he is and who we are in relationship to who he is. Yahweh is God, and you are not, and you never will be. Now, there's a whole bunch of, of worldviews out there, and I could be here all day talking about the lies that the world is selling us, but I want to talk about where we should be, a biblical worldview, because in the end, that's the only one that's going to benefit you. Now, I looked up biblical worldview to try to get a definition for it. And basically, this is the definition that they have for a biblical worldview. So we'll go through these little points, and we'll see if you have a biblical worldview. 
The first thing is you have to believe that Yeshua lived a sinless life. That he that was without sin became sin for us sinners. We all believe that, right? That Yeshua had no sin. So if you believe that, and then you believe that Yahweh is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and still rules today. That means he's all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, and he's sovereign. You know that and believe that, you have a biblical worldview. That salvation is a gift from Yahweh and cannot be earned. You believe that, you have a biblical worldview. That Satan is real. You believe that, you have a biblical worldview. That as Christians, we have a responsibility to share our faith with others. If you believe that, you have a biblical worldview. And that the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. If you believe that, you have a biblical worldview. So basically, a biblical worldview begins with seeing things the way that Yahweh sees them. That's it in a nutshell. It's not developed with worldly wisdom. Most of what Yahweh instructs us to do makes absolutely no sense by worldly standards. No sense at all. But we are a peculiar people, right? We are set apart from the majority. So it shouldn't make sense to them because they're not part of the family. We have to be careful that we line our lives up with the word of Yahweh and not allow these worldviews to come in and pollute and distort our way of thinking. Because when we do, we too are the world. And at the end, the world will be condemned. And if you are a part of it, you will be condemned right along with it. Yahweh bless.